coming on tonight and we thank our audience for joining in with us. Our scripture tonight will come from Psalm 56, verse number 4. And it says, In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I am not afraid. What can flesh do to me? That's Psalm 56 and 4. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I am not afraid. What can flesh do to me? And our song for tonight is I will trust the Lord.
blessed your name. Lord, we glorify you, we lift you up. God, there is no God like you. Lord, we sing hallowed to your name. God, we praise you, we worship you. Lord, we magnify you for you are good and you are God. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for another privilege to come to your house of prayer. We ask you to bless us now as we listen to your word, as we read your word, study your word. We pray, Father God, that you bless us, Father God, that we will glean from your word, that your word will be real to us, that your word will be a blessing to us, that your word will be received by us, and that we will do your word according to your will. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us, forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank you. In the Almighty, the Almighty God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. We bless God for another privilege, another opportunity to be here on the land of the dying, headed for the land of the living. Amen. Amen. Yes, Lord, God has blessed us again to be present, and we can count our blessings, name them one by one. Hallelujah. Count our blessings, name our blessings one by one. Hallelujah to the Lamb. God has tremendously blessed us. Last week, we were on page 23. We're still walking through the book, Experiencing God, Experiencing God. We're in unit one, and we will move tonight to day five. Unit one, day five. Last week, we were on page 23. We talked about Amos chapter three, verse seven. says, indeed, the Lord does nothing without revealing his counsel to his servants and his prophets, or to his servants, the prophets. God does nothing without revealing himself, revealing his will, letting us see what he's doing. God let us know what he's doing before he do it. Isn't that something? I wouldn't say that if I was reading it. Because I know God doing some things. I don't know what he's doing. Anybody else in the room? I don't know what God is doing. But one thing I'm, I, am, I am convinced and convicted of. Whatever God is doing, he's doing what's best for us. Amen. He's doing what's best for his will. He's doing what's, what's best to give him the glory. Men always try to seek God's glory. But we have to give all glory to God. The first reality is that God was already at work around Moses on page 23. God was already at work around Moses. We're looking at Exodus chapter 2, Exodus chapter 3, and Exodus chapter 4. But as we get into day 5, we go all the way to Exodus chapter 14. So the first reality is God was already at work around Moses. The idea here is that God is always at work. He is always at work around us. God is always doing something. Number two, the second reality, God pursued a continuing love relationship with Moses that was real and personal. God pursued a love, a continuing love relationship with Moses that was real and personal. The idea here is God is already at work around us and now he is pursuing a loving, continual loving relationship with us. The almighty, the amazing God, the God of the universe is pursuing you. And he's pursuing you to have a continual love relationship with you. And this love relationship with you is real and it's personal. Yeah. What he's saying is, this is a real thing that God is doing with us. He really loves us. 
He loves us so much until he pursues us. And it is so real until he has made it personal just us. Yes. The God that we serve, he can make everything personal to every person and still be God and still answers everybody's call. Amen. He can still answer. I've been trying to call people all day to make sure we got everything lined up. And guess what? More times than not, it rolled up to the answer machine. <laughs> More times than not, it says, and somebody can tell me the difference between the two, the person that you are calling is not available or your message, your call has been sent to the answering service. Does that mean that they took the time to reject my call? Or is this automatically just going over to the answering machine? They might have been on automatic. It's automatic? Yes. Both of them? One says, one says the person that you have called is not available. The other one says your call has been sent to voicemail. So the phone automatically does it? It automatically done after so many rings. It automatically does it? Why did it change message then? Depends on the company you with. Oh, it's the company. <laughs> well, that's the right answer anyway. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. That's, that's so encouraging to me. I mean, you just encouraged me tonight. I hate to think that people didn't reject, 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 reject when we still are trying to do business. Amen? So, so God is not like that. God is able to make his personal calls, make it real to me, make it real to you, make it real to everybody, and he will make it personal. See, I may need a slapjack sandwich. You may need a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And God is able to give both of us what we need because he's a personal God. Now, whether he thinks that's best for us right now or not, uh, that's up to God. But God has been pursuing us. And as he's pursuing us, he's pursuing us for the reason of having a love relationship. That's right. I believe, and you can correct me, if, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that everybody wants to feel loved. It's not enough to be loved, but you want to feel like you're loved. Anybody in the room? You want to feel like somebody loves you. That's right. And you want to feel love even in your bad times. And check this out. You want to feel love even when you're bad. <laughs> no? Yes? I, want, I just want somebody to love me. And because I want somebody to love me, we have this awesome, amazing God <laughs> who is loving on us, who is pursuing us. It's real and it's personal. Number three, the third reality, God invited Moses to become involved with him in his work. The first reality is that God is at work all around us. The second reality is God pursuing, is pursuing us. The third reality is God has given us the invitation. God invited Moses, so God is inviting us to become involved with him in his work. God wanted us to be involved with him in his work. Why would God want us involved with him in his work? It's God's work, right? God can. I guarantee you, God is not doing it because God is not, he's not inviting you because he's not able to do it. He's not inviting you because he doesn't have the strength or the know-how to do it. See, us smart folk, we smart folk, and all of us are smart, right? God is not enlisting us to join him at work because he needs some smart people on his team. I guarantee you. I guarantee you that God is smarter than all of us. We haven't been able to hang the moon, the stars. We haven't been able to make the, the world go around and revolve at the same time, rotation and re revolutions. We can't do it, right? But guess who did? God does it. God, God has the ability to make the world look flat and then we find out it's right. <laughs> That's simply amazing to me. Mm -hmm. And before Christmas Columbus came about, before Matthew Alexander Henson came into play, God already knew. 
Who knows who Matthew Alexander Henson, who he is? This is your, your culture moment, your heritage moment. Matthew Alexander Henson. I think he lived somewhere where it was cold because I remember his picture and he had this big old furry thing on his head. You got a microphone right there. It's not worth saying it on the microphone. Oh, if it's the right answer, say it on the microphone. <laughs> okay, say what you said then. I remember his picture as being a man with his big old furry hat of some sort on his head, like he was from the cold part of the. Okay. So when we think of cold, what do we think of? Two places that will come to mind right away. Come on before everybody, everybody Googles it. Where your aunt is from. Uh, Alaska is the first one. What's the other place? The North Pole. The North Pole. North Pole. Right? These two places come in mind when we talk about coal. So Matthew Alexander Henson was the great, great grandfather uh, to Raji P. Henson, and he was the first person to walk on the North Pole. Okay. Mr. Perry, that we read about in the history books, enlisted Matthew Alexander Henson to go with him because he was a great explorer, to go with him, and to he was the first person to put foot on the North Pole. And guess what? That's what Daddy used to say about me. You are a tad up in it, Daddy. You are you explore anything. I told you about that time I, I had my first class in radio TV, my first semester. I went, now I'm not living with mom and dad, but I'm gonna go over there and fix everything. I went over there, I knew enough to be dangerous. I went over there and the speaker on the right side of the hi-fi wasn't working. What's the hi-fi? Stereo. Stereo. Everybody know what hi-fi is? High five? Everybody but two know what the high five is. So I go to my mama and daddy's house and I, I'm going to fix the high five speaker. And I messed around and left the, the speaker wire. See, I knew the speaker wires don't carry enough current to blow anything up. But some kind of way I let the hot wire and the ground wire or the hot wire and, and, the, and the cold wire touch. Neutral. They touch. And everything in the house went, Ooh. That's not a good sound when you mess with electricity. And it wasn't my house. Not only was it not my house, I didn't even live there anymore. Matthew Alexander Davis had just messed up. I guarantee you I messed up. I can still see the image of daddy coming out the back room in the dark. <laughs> At night, in the dark. And he wasn't smiling like Brother Whitlock. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't doing that. So Matthew Alexander Henson was an explorer, and he was the first man to walk on the North Pole. We have been giving credit to Brother Perry, but Matthew Alexander Henson was the first. Amen? Somebody said, well, how do you know you weren't there? We believe Jesus we weren't there. Yes? You believe Jesus? You believe he, he died, he was buried, he rose? You believe he really lived? You believe he lay, was laid in a tomb and his bones are no longer there? We weren't there, too, but we believe it. So we have to understand that God is asking us to come and get involved. Brother Perry asked Matthew Alexander Henson to come get involved. And he went and got involved. And he is in history. We used to say that Beirut was, a, was the greatest home run hit of all time. Now what? Now what? Now that they've taken the two leagues and merged them together, we find out new stuff. Yes? So we have to understand that God is asking us to get involved so much so until his work is going to go on without us, but he's inviting us to get involved. God wants us to get involved. That's the third reality. Today, on, on day number five, we're looking at the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seven realities. There are only seven realities to experiencing God, according to Henry Belakabee in his book, Experiencing God. 
Okay, can you pass us the sister Bernie for that mic? And she's gonna do reality number four. Reality number four. Okay, um, reality number four, God spoke to reveal himself, his purpose, and his ways. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire hung within a bush. God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, he answered. Do not come any closer, he said. Remove the sandals from your feet. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt and have heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know about their suffering, and I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptian and to bring them from the land to a good and spacious land. And that's Exodus 3, 2 through 8. If there is any prophet among you from the Lord, I make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. I will speak directly. I will speak with him directly. And that's Numbers 12, 6 through 8. Amen. Thank you. So we see that God spoke to reveal himself. He spoke to reveal himself, to reveal his purpose, and to reveal his ways. Who spoke? God spoke. Man, when God speaks, E.F. Hutton has to take a back seat. Who remember E.F. Hutton and commercial E.F. Hutton? When E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Everybody listen. When E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listen. But when God speaks, everybody listens and everybody should respond. When God speaks, E.F. Hutton has nothing on God. So when we look at the text, it says, God speaks to reveal, or God spoke to reveal himself. He spoke to, to, to reveal his purpose. He spoke to reveal his ways. I told you two weeks ago that God revealed his way to Moses, and he revealed his mighty acts to men. We need to know God's ways. How does God handle things? If that's God or not. Is it God? In our Congress, is it God? In our households, is it God? In our schools, in our school system, is it God? In our state, is it God? We have to know God's ways, and then when we get to know his ways, we can tell people, that's not God. That's not of God. I remember having a meeting right here at the New Beginning Church, and um, I just got tired of hearing it. So I couldn't raise my voice, because then I would be out of character. Then I'd be wondering, is it God? So I said to him and them, this is a conversation that's not worth me having. This is a conversation that is satanic. This is a conversation that's not of God. And I begin to stand. You have to get to a point in your life where you recognize God so much until you know when something is of God and is not of God. Because there are lonely, a lot of fakes out there, a lot of imitations, I remember growing up, we thought we had something when we got what we call a leather jacket. It wasn't a leather jacket, it was a pleather jacket. But we called it leather. It was so soft and so attractive, and it shined a lot better than leather. It wasn't leather, it was pleather. It was an imitation. But we were broke, so we just enjoyed it as leather. I mean, we just enjoyed it. And if you walk past a wall too close, that leather would be ripped. It would start in your arm and rip all the way around your back. 
That was a devastating moment. I'm saying to you, there's a lot of imitation stuff out there. The Lord told me you're going to be my wife. Well, don't you think God is God enough to tell her as well as you? The Lord told me you're going to be my husband. And look, and sisters, I'm, I'm here to tell you now, there are a lot more sisters that's claiming men than men claiming sisters. They have even gotten it to the point now where women are proposing to men. They are down on their knees. Sister Brown, they're down on their knees with the ring. Will you marry me? Brother Taylor, women in this generation are down on their knees begging, asking, Women are asking men, will you marry me? Mm. Think about this, Sister Brown. Isn't that Bible? Isn't that a scripture that talks about the time when women will ask men to marry them or to take away their shame? Women will, and we got to research that one. <laughs> <laughs> now, now we, we listen to the Bible and we may have been going a little too fast. <laughs> well, well, to your defense, in the book of Ruth, the Bible talks about how Ruth approached Jabez. I mean, Boaz. He, he appro she approached Boaz. However, it was after Boaz approached her. And, and the Bible is very dis dis descriptive of how. Can y'all stay in Bible study? Just, just look at that after a while. <laughs> just stay in Bible study. Don't, don't let Sister Brown throw y'all off. <laughs> <laughs> just, let's just say it now. <laughs> so, so yeah, Ruth approached Boaz, and as she approached Boaz, she did some things that we tell our women of the day not to do. You, you're right. But was that a proposal? What I see today is women down on their knees asking men to marry them. Yes. The Bible said you ought to do it, Sister Brown. You just told me that, right? <laughs> oh, you didn't tell me that? I said it. Oh, he said other folk ought to do it. No, that, that they will be doing it. They will be doing it. Yes. Is that a good thing? I don't think so. You don't think so? What do you think, Brother Whitlock? Bleach is on. He's smiling. Say again. It's backwards. It's backwards, okay. Who sets the standards, though? Who sets the standards? We're just talking about a proposal. We ain't talking about much more now. We're just talking, we're just talking about the sister getting on her knees, asking the man, look at him in his eyes and say, I can't do without you. Will you marry me? The other question becomes, do the men support that? Do me and one woman that will bow down and say, will you marry me? Okay, let me go back to the book. <laughs> God is speaking. And when God speaks, we ought to know God's ways. We ought to know God's purpose. And we ought to know that God is trying to reveal himself. Whenever God speaks. How does God speak to us these days? Through his word. His word. Any way? Any other way? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Any other way? Through prayer. Any other way? Through people, preachers, teachers. Any other way? The author says through circumstances, situations. I gave you an example. Who remember my example? How God spoke to me and I just shut it down. Who remember my example? First time God tried to speak to me is through his Holy Spirit. Second time he tried to speak to me is through Roosevelt Weeks. 
I would hear the third time he tried to stick to me as he turned my car round and around off 59, off 59 into the dirt and the mud and let me drive right out of there. I heard him for two weeks. The next time God spoke to me, I was sitting up there with my picture and my supervisor had his picture and my coworkers had their picture and we had popcorn. I was sitting in the brewing queue and up came a gun. The circumstances God spoke to me. And I hadn't been back to the blue in a few cents. It took all that. God talking to me took all that to shut me down. Two things I'm not wrestling with. Snake and a gun. I'm not doing it. It's not worth it. I was digging in the yard one day and I said, ooh, that moves like a snake. I said, it's a dead snake. <laughs> he did 500 times. <laughs> when I got through putting that everywhere, I, when I'm working in the yard, I take a shower everywhere I go. That little, little, little bitty, so I take them everywhere I go, everywhere I go. When I come on, on the campus, I got something with me everywhere I go. <laughs> can't deal with the snake, can't deal with the, can't play with them. God is speaking to us through the Holy Spirit, through his word, through circumstances, through people. God is speaking through us, through his Bible. God is speaking to us. He's trying to get our attention. So God is speaking to us, and these are the purposes. Number one, he wants to reveal himself. Number two, he wants his purpose revealed to us. And number three, he wants his ways to be revealed to us. Look what he says in the text. He says, Moses, don't you come another step closer. Who's talking? God is speaking. He says, Moses, do not come any closer. Moses, stop. Remove your sandals from your feet. Take your shoes off. Why did God say that? For the place where you are standing is holy ground. Why do we bow our heads when we pray? Why do we close our eyes when we pray? Why don't you close your eyes? Why don't you bow your head? I was talking to somebody the other day and I said, let me pray with you, but don't close your eyes while you're driving. And it's amazing. You have to tell folk that. I mean, you have to tell them. They get caught up in the spirit and close their eyes. You know, we got some super, super spiritual folk these days. I said, I am going to pray with you, pray for you, but don't close your eyes while you're driving. Super spiritual people will say, God will take the wheel. And you need that telephone pole. <laughs> Oh, God's going to pick it up, reset it just for you. You need to know God's way. You need to know that it's for his purpose. You need to know that it is for himself to be revealed. God is speaking to us so we can understand him, himself, understand his purpose, and understand his way. So he says to Moses, don't come closer. Remove your standards, for the place you're standing is holy ground. Then he continued to identify himself. What did God say to Moses? Who did, how did God identify himself to Moses? God of Abraham. I am the God of your father. Lowercase father, right? Why is that a lowercase father? Lowercase F. I'm the God of your father. It's a man father, right? It's a, it's a human being. When we see an uppercase F, that's God the Father, the Holy Father. Some denominations have a father as their preacher. Um, it's a lowercase father. Okay? I hope it's, it's seen as a lowercase father. Because God the Father is the Father. Then he says, I am the God of your father. And who he says? I'm the God of... Abraham, I'm the God of, I am the God of 
Why, why is he saying that? Because everybody knew the God of the Bible was also the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Everybody knew the God of Israel was the God of the Bible, which is God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob important? Simply because God made a promise to Abraham, a covenant with him. That all these sands on the seashore that you see, there are going to be so many folk that you're going to be the father of. All these stars up in the sky, it's going to be just as many people that you're going to be the father of. You are not going to be their heavenly father. You are not going to be their biological father, but you're going to be the father of faith. Such it is today. When, you, when a pastor has a pastor, we call that pastor the father of our faith. The father of our faith. So, he identifies himself as the God of, God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He goes on to say, I need my people rescued. Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 through 8. Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 through 8. He says, I have a plan, and I want to use you in my plan. God is revealing himself to Moses, just as he's revealing himself to us. He says, I have a plan. I have a purpose. I have, I have a way that I need you to understand. He says that I have heard the cries of the people. The Israelites were in Egypt. They were crying out for God to send them a a Messiah, a Redeemer, somebody that can, can deliver them, a deliverer. And he chose Moses, oh stuttering Moses. Moses who couldn't talk. Moses who we found out last week, or we re re reiterated last week, Moses who was a murderer. How many of you would go out and look for a pastor and one of his, one of his qualifications need to be that he's a murderer? Raise your hand if you you go and look for a pastor. He has to be a murderer. On the on the description, the job description must be a murderer. Anybody? Why not, Sister Davis? Davis why not? No. You think he'll murder you? <laughs> but God goes. And God already knows Moses' resume, and God goes and put on the payroll, chooses him as the leader, a murderer. A murderer. A man that couldn't even talk. He puts me to shame when he talks. He couldn't even talk. He couldn't even talk good enough to well enough to, uh, to tell God, yeah, I accept or reject. In the midst of God calling him, he couldn't even get two, three words out to say, Lord, I can't talk. And guess what? The Lord already knew his, his limitations. I want to tell you, God knows your limitations. And he still wanted to use you. God knows your limitation. He still wants to reveal himself to you. God knows your limitations. He still wants to reveal his purpose to you. God knows your limitations. He still wants to reveal to you his ways. God knows you. He knows you're not all that folk think you are. It's, it's, it's a situation where we are in this human body and most people don't really know the real us. Because if you really, really, really knew the real us, you wouldn't be around us. Our stuff stinks. Our attitude, our actions, our past smells. Everybody in this room deserves a probation officer. Everybody in the room. You may not have one, you may have never had one. But everybody in this room needs to be reporting right now to a probation officer. Not once a month. You need to go to every day. But God uses us in spite of us. God is using us to reveal himself 
to reveal his ways and to reveal all that we go through to show us his purpose. God want to use you. Don't get so lackadaisy in what you do. Don't do some this day and some this day. Don't, don't pull back when somebody gets on your nerves. You know, human beings are, are really, really good at pulling back, especially when the pastor gets on their nerves. <laughs> Man, that joke of that, I ain't doing that just because he said it. <laughs> we have to respect the office, even if we don't respect the person. 2016 to 2020 is was very hard to respect the office. But I had to respect the office. It was difficult. It was very difficult. But you respect the office, even if you don't respect the person. Yes? Respect the office. God, God is saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he says, I've heard the cries because they're being oppressed. God hears, that's a good point right there. That's a good test question right there. God hears your cries and God sees your oppression and your oppressors. God is not in the dark when you are oppressed. He knows you have been passed over three times. He knows you're more qualified for the job. He knows who's pulling strings in the dark. God sees your oppression and he sees your oppressors. God is not in the dark. He says, I want to rescue my people from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from that land to a good and spacious land, which is called the promised land. Is that something that God is trying to rescue you from? I'm telling you, God wants to rescue you from some things, some people, some attitudes, and God is working behind the scenes. Reality number five comes from Exodus chapter 3, verses 11 through Exodus 10 and 13. So let's see what the fifth reality is, God's invitation. Reality five. God's invitation for Moses to work with him led to a crisis of belief that required faith and action. Moses expressed a crisis of belief when he made the following statements to God. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? If I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I tell them? What if they don't what if they won't believe me? It will not obey, but say, the Lord did not appear to you. Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, either in the past or recently, or since you have been speaking to your servant, because my mouth and my tongue are sluggish. Please, Lord, send someone else. Exodus 3, 11, 13, 3, chapter 3, verses 11 and 13, chapter 4, verses 1, 10, and 13. So, here Moses is, this is where it really hits home. God calls him. And during this, this conversation they're having while God's calling him, he reminds God as if God didn't know. God, I'm limited. Look, look at what he says. He says, and he got all kinds of questions. You, ain't, ain't just like us. We got all kinds of questions when we don't want to do some things. Who am I? Who am I that I should go before Pharaoh? Who am I that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Lord, who am I? And if I go to the Israelites, will they say, what is his name who sent me? Who am I? If I go before the Israel, go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors have sent you, have sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I tell them? Boy, he's full of questions. Have you ever asked those 
rhetorical questions or really, really questions that you want answers to? Who am I? Who, who am I that I would be even standing here tonight? Do I qualify to stand here tonight? Who am I that that, uh, that I, God has chosen me to even stand? It'll be 20 years before the New Beginning Church. 32 years before the Lord. Who am I? And even before then, at the age of 12, who am I? God is such an awesome and amazing God that he chooses people and when he chooses them, he throws them into a crisis of belief. This crisis of belief requires faith and requires action. Do you know something that you don't want to do? Have you ever been given an assignment and you're like, I ain't doing this. <laughs> Have you ever been given an assignment and you know the assignment is the right thing to do and you came to the conclusion, I'm not worthy of it. Have you ever been given an assignment and you just felt like you wasn't qualified to do it or wasn't made the right way to do it? Anybody? Talk to me. Anybody? Have you ever been given a responsibility? Let me tell you something. Parenting is a humongous responsibility. Grandparenting, great-grandparenting. It's a humongous responsibility. And I can look at some people today and say, uh, I think they went instead of sent. When I see children get cussed out in the grocery store, I mean long words and short words. They are not qualified, neither are they fit to be parents. But God chose them. And every child that God chooses is a blessing from the Lord. Even us, we, we are and we were blessings from the Lord. Did your parents always think that you were a blessing? <laughs> or they looked at you and said, Lord, why me? Lord, have mercy, Lord. Why? Why? Mama, mama probably listened and said, yeah, I said it many nights. <laughs> have, you, have you ever been placed in a position or a predicament that you knew you were not qualified and then God chooses you anyway? Henry Blackaby says it like this. He says that that you are thrown into a crisis of belief. And while you're in that crisis of belief, you got to have faith and it takes some action. You still got to take action. Even if you think you're not qualified, even if you think God is not with you, you have to have faith in God and you have to take action. Question or comments? Moses goes on and asks, what if they won't believe? What if they don't believe me? What if they won't believe me and will not obey me? But say the Lord did not appear to you. Now he's questioning God about what people are going to question him about. Sound like an excuse to me. Sound like he's in a crisis of belief. Number one, he doesn't believe that he's qualified. Number two, he can't believe that God has chosen to use him. In our local churches, if everybody would find out where God is at work around them, where God is giving them an invitation to join him, there will be no heavy loads on anybody. That's right. Not even the pastor. If everybody, and we did the gift assessment at one time here at the New Beginning Church, if everybody would get in that vein where God has called you and just run with what God has called you to do, and, and just because he called you doesn't mean it's going to be easy. You still got to stay with him. You still got to walk with him. I believe, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God has called me, and I had more tough days than good days. Paul Jones said he had more good days than bad days. When it comes to the calling, sometimes your calling will give you more bad days than good days. It's a crisis of belief. And when you get in that crisis of belief, you still got to have faith in the God who calls you. 
the statement goes, you can tell who was just going or who just went and who was sent. The Bible says, how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they go unless they be sent? You can tell who just went and they went and sent. When you just went, you just throw up your hands and holler. I'm done. One person would say, I am Mississippi done. D-U-N done. I'm done. But when you call, you're convinced of your calling. Even if it's called to be married, if it's called to be a friend, if you're convicted of your calling, you know one thing. It's hard for God. It's going to see you. I mean, y'all, raise your hand if you think it's just easy for Sister David to be married to me. <laughs> raise your hand way up in the air, way up, waving like you just don't care. <laughs> y'all know it's easy. <laughs> y'all see her laughing. You see her smiling. Y'all know it's easy, right, Sister Bernie? It is easy. She doesn't even have a crisis of belief. Because it's so easy. Let me just tell you, whatever you're called to do, you will be faced with a crisis every now and then, but God is calling you so he can reveal his purpose to you, reveal his ways to you, and reveal who he is. It is a crisis of belief. And then Moses goes on to say, please, Lord, I have never been eloquent. I mean, Lord, I, I ain't ever been able to stand and speak with the eloquence. He said, Lord, either in the past or recently or since you have been speaking to me, your servant. He telling God, he telling God, he said, God, I ain't been able to talk right from the start. <laughs> Lord, I haven't been able to talk right even since you've been talking to me. <laughs> What he said is, you know how we put it back on God. What he said is, God, you ain't fixed my tongue yet. <laughs> and now you want me to go talk for you. He, look at what he says. He says, he says, I ain't been able to do this in the past. I ain't been able to do this recently. And I haven't been able to do it since I've been talking to you. Lord, you know when I come before you, I'm still stuttering. I still can't put my S's and my T's together. And don't ask me to put the THRs together. <laughs> he said, Lord, I am not eloquent of speech. I don't even know how to talk. And then he goes on to tell God how God made his mouth. <laughs> because my mouth and my tongue are sluggish. Who made his mouth? Who put his tongue in there? So he's blaming God, right? Now, God, number one, I'm not eloquent. I can't speak like other people. Choose somebody else. Number two, God, I haven't been able to speak eloquently in the past. I, hate, I haven't done it in the, in the present. I haven't done it recently. And Lord, I haven't even done it while I've been talking to you. And you know I haven't done it. And then he said, now Lord, you know that my mouth and my tongue are both sluggish. My tongue, they call it, my tongue is heavy. You know I can't do this, God. So it says, Lord, please send somebody else. Reality number, number six. Reality number six. This is found in Hebrews 11, 24 through 29. Hebrews 11, 24 through 29 is the, is the, the verse that's, that's compared to. Along with Exodus chapter 4, 19 through 20. Exodus chapter 4, 19 through 20. Reality six. Moses had to make major adjustments in his life to join God to join God in what he was doing. Moses' crisis of belief called for faith and action. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to call the son of Pharaoh's daughter and choose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. By faith, he left Egypt behind not being afraid of the king's anger for Moses' perseverance as one who sees him who is in, invisible. 
By faith he instituted the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch the Israelites. By faith they crossed the Red Sea as though they were on dry land. When the Egyptians attempted to do this, they were drowned. Hebrews 11, 24 through 29. Now in the millennium, the Lord told Moses, return to Egypt, for all the men who want to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and son, put them on a donkey, and returned to the land of Egypt. Exodus 4, 19 through 20. Thank you. So Moses had to make major adjustments in his life. If he was going to join God, enjoy what God was doing, he had to make adjustments. Do you make adjustments to join God where he's going to work and what he's doing? Or does God have to find out where you at work and do what you're doing? God is in, in action. God is in motion. God is doing some things all around us. God is at work. And as he's at work, he shows us things in the midst of our crisis of belief. He shows us, and we have to make major adjustments. We have to make adjustments. We have to make adjustments in our entire life. Sometimes we have to adjust our attitude. Sometimes we have to adjust our action. Sometimes we have to adjust our friendships. You even have to adjust your family relationships. You have to put yourself in a point where you can reach God, God can reach you, you can join God where he's at work, you can accept God's invitation to join him. You have to make major, and every adjustment ought to be a major adjustment. Some of us can't even make slight adjustments. Slight adjustments. Cold outside. Too cold to go out there to get their church. As if we have no heat. Slight adjustment. Four drops of rain stopped 20 Christians from going to church. I like to say, not even the drops of rain, just a prediction from the meteorologist stopped 20 church, church, church members from going to church. Or 20 Christians. I mean Christians. So we have to make major adjustments. Moses' crisis of belief called for faith in action. We say love is an action word, meaning that we got to do some things. We got to change some things. The Apostle Paul picks this thought up in Romans chapter 12. He says, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So stay, let me see that bottle of water if you would. He says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. This water, wherever you put it, wherever you lay it, it's going to take on the shape of that bottle. It's conforming to it. It's going to do whatever, whatever shape it falls in. That's what the, the Lord is saying to us. Do not, whatever you do, do not conform to the things of this world. Don't conform. Don't, don't blend in with it. But he says, be ye trans. <laughs> Make a difference. He said, be ye transformed. This was a good bottle of water, right? <laughs> Too late now. <laughs> I guess it's not so easy being married to me. <laughs> so when, when the bottle is in, when the water is in the bottle, it is conforming to it. It takes on the shape. It does whatever the bottle does. Every bump, every crevice, it does whatever the bottle does. But the transformation takes place when we drink it and it gives us strength, it gives us power, gives us hope. Man can actually live without water for 40 hours, but don't try. Man can live without food for 40 days. I don't have to tell you not to try Man can live without air for seven minutes. 
But man cannot live two seconds without hope. God is the only one that can give us hope. He gives Moses hope, and Moses has to make sure that he made major adjustments. What did Moses do? Moses was reared in Pharaoh's camp. The daughter of Pharaoh was to be named his mama. But Moses refused the eloquence. He refused to make sure. He made sure that he remained an Israelite, a Hebrew. He refused the pleasures of the Egyptians. It's like you refusing to be Greg's Addis child. <laughs> That's not a hard one there at all. <laughs> you refuse the luxuries of the palace. Moses had to make major adjustments. Moses had to do things differently in order to be with God. And today, we got to do things differently. We can't just live willy-nilly. We got to make some changes. And it doesn't matter if you made changes yesterday or not. You got to make some more changes today. Every day ought to be a day of reckoning, a day of change, a day of making life better for you. As you join God when he's at work. God is at work. We got to join him. Come to me. We have to join him where he is at work. Then God speaks to Moses and said, now Moses, you can return back to Egypt now. The folk that wanted to kill you, they did now. Going back, going back to, to Egypt. When Moses got there, God did some miraculous things. Look up the 10 plagues. God did some miraculous things. And one of the things he did, he sprinkled the blood over the doorposts. He had the people, rather, to sprinkle the blood over the doorposts. And when the death angel came by, he overpassed, passed over. That's where we get the word Passover. He overpassed or he passed over the blood and the, the firstborn boy in that house did not die. There were cries in the middle of the night. Egyptian babies were dying in the middle of the night. But those who put the blood of the lamb over the doorposts, the death angel passed over. I'm telling you, this is a good point to write down and maybe on test. I'm telling you, God knows how to protect us. And in the morning when you get up, try this, try this. Every morning you get up, every morning until Jesus gets back, every morning you get up, either read or listen to Psalm 91. This is what an angel, I mean, this is what the devil tried to quote uh, the book the Bible to Jesus. Go on, jump. God will give his angels charge over you. In, in, in Psalm 91, if you dwell under the wings of the Most High, he will protect you. He will not allow any danger to come near you. He will give his angels charge over you. God has a way of protecting us even when we deserve to die. I'm going to tell you the truth. Tonight, all of us deserve to die. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that we all have sinned. That means we all deserve to die. But then he says in Romans 6, 23, that God has given us life. God has spared us. Then he says in Romans 5 and 8, he says that while we were yet in the midst of our sin, God demonstrated his love toward us until he sent Jesus to die for us for our sins. The innocent took on the punishment of the guilty. When they were, when they were in Egypt, there was one lamb killed for one household. When they were in the wilderness, there was one lamb killed for one nation. But when Jesus died on Calvary, there was one lamb killed for the entire world. When Adam and Eve messed up in the garden, it was one lamb killed for one person. One for Adam, one for Eve. When they were, they, when they were in Egypt and the death angel passed over, it was one lamb killed for one household. 
When they were in the wilderness after they had left Egypt, there was one lamb killed for the whole nation. But on Calvary, it was one lamb killed for the whole world. His name is Jesus. Okay, brother, this not the boy. I get caught up. Revelation number seven. <laughs> Revelation number seven. It's not hard for me to get caught up of what God is doing. Reality number seven. Moses came to know God by experience as he obeyed God, and God accomplished his work through Moses. Many texts throughout Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy illustrate how God revealed his nature and his purposes to Moses. As Moses obeyed God, God accomplished through Moses what Moses could not do in his own strength. Here is one example in which Moses and the people came to know God as their deliverer. Exodus chapter 14, verses 15 through 17. The Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to break camp. As for you, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it so that the, so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. As for me, I am going to harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, and I receive glory by means of Pharaoh, all his army, and his chariots, and horsemen. Verses 21 through 23. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back with a powerful east wind all that night and turned the sea into dry land. So the waters were divided, and, then, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with the waters like a wall to them on their right and their left. The Egyptians set out and pursued. Verses 26 and 27. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back on the Egyptians, on their chariots and horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea returned to its normal depth. Verses 29 through 31. But the Israelites had walked through the sea on dry ground, with the waters like a wall to them on their right and their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the power of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and believed in him and in his servant Moses. Thank you. Look at what happens. Reality number seven, Moses came to know God by experience. As he obeyed God. God want an experience to take place in our lives in such a way, but we have to obey God. As he obeyed God, God, God allowed Moses to experience him and get to know him. And so as he experienced him and get to know him, and God accomplished his work through Moses. God is looking to accomplish his work through you. But you have to obey him, have faith in him, and be real with him. And you have to obey him so he can accomplish things. Your experience with God ought to be an experience that God can use you to accomplish some things. Too many people just living life from day to day, they're getting up in the morning, they're doing what they do, whether it's work or sit on the gallery, whatever they choose to do, they choose to do, they just going through life. And we get up the next morning and do the same thing over and over again. But when you experience God, God uses you to be a blessing to this world. When you die, don't worry about men. When you die, what is it that God can say that you left? on planet Earth by impacting the world. What has God accomplished through you? Can God say anything? Can God brag on, on you like he bragged on, on, on Job? Can God brag on you? 
I know this is my child. You need to try out Job. Maybe, maybe God has, has told the devil he needs to try you out. And then when he tries you, will you turn your back on God? Job lost his children, lost his houses, lost his cattle, and he lost his wife. Woman said, man, you got these boils all over you. You've been sick. All our children are dead. Why don't you just cuss God and die? Moses comes, I mean, Job comes to the conclusion, though he, say, he slays me, yet will I trust. Do you trust God like that? So here's Moses. Uh, Moses is considered the author of, of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. God revealed his nature. God revealed his purposes. Ask God to reveal your nature to me, God. I want to know how you handle things. I want to know, God, how you do things. I want to know, God, how you think about things. As Moses obeyed God, God accomplished through Moses what Moses could not accomplish in his own strength. That is powerful. As we obey God, God can accomplish some things through us that we can't accomplish in our own strength. God, God reveals himself at the moment when we're about to give up. When you are about to lose it, God continues to reveal himself. When you're about to, who was the songwriter say, I want to throw up my hands and holler and just give up. When you get to that point, just hold on. Don't give up. Don't give out. Don't give in. Just hold on. God is trying to do something with you. Don't give up. Wait. Isaiah picks this thought up and says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run, even the young folk passing out. Shakari Richardson just passed out. And you still run. That's, that's an analogy now. Don't Google. What he says is, is the young sprinters will run and they will give up. They will give out. They will faint. But if you wait on the Lord, even in your old age, God will hold you and you will, your strength will be renewed. And the young folk will be like, how do you do that, old man? It's the experience I have with God. I, like, I, I, I love to play young boys in, in basketball. They're like, oh man, how do you do that? It's the experience. I know when to stump your toe. It's the experience. I know when you're going to shake and bake and move because you're going to tell everybody before you do it. I love playing pool with, with young boys who, who think that, oh, I'm going to swipe this old man up. I know my geometry. It's that experience. When you have experience with God, you can do some things that others can't do. And God said to Moses, why are you crying to me? Go tell those people break camp. Go tell him it's time to go. Tell him it's time to leave us alone. God has already proven himself. God has shook the whole foundation of Egypt. And then when they leave, God hardens his heart, Pharaoh's heart, so he would chase after them. I want to tell you, God put some of your enemies in, in place in front of you. God has hardened the hearts of your enemies so they will try to tear you down. But the good thing about it, God will wipe them out. He goes on to get the glory. God gets the glory because he kills Pharaoh and his army. They dead, land like dead fish on the side of the sea while the children of Israel march through on dry ground. God created a highway for them to march through. And then he closes it up and Pharaoh in his arm drowns. And the Bible says that God raised the sea right back to a normal level. Nobody can do it like God can. No one can do it. When Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and believed 
in him and in his servant Moses. I'm telling you, God can create some circumstances that will blow your mind. Sickness. Look at what God does. He is the great physician. Courtroom scene. He's the judge and he's an attorney that never lost the case. God is able to do whatever we cannot imagine. He's able to do it. He even did it through Jesus. Died on Calvary, buried in the bar tomb, rose from the dead, and now he's still saving people. He's still saving people over 2,000 years later just by this simple story. And if you believe this story tonight, you can be born again. You can be saved right where you are. If you would, just bow your head with me and invite Jesus Christ into your life, believing this little simple story that over 2,000 years ago, God did a miraculous thing. God himself gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Will you join me in prayer and invite Jesus Christ into your life? Just say these simple words, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you honestly pray this prayer, you are now born again, that you're on your way to heaven, and that God is welcoming you. Let's continue to pray and lift up the name of Jesus and watch what God is doing around us so we can join him where he is, already at work. And so we can be blessed by him, by allowing him to accomplish in us what we can't do in ourselves. God is able. It is oftentimes time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering and sacrificial gifts. If you want to give electronically, you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can mail it to P.O. Box 503. Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Are there any praise reports or prayer requests? We are certainly praying for our missionaries who will be leaving uh, Wednesday night, Thursday morning, tonight, early in the morning. We're praying for our domestic missionaries. It's about uh, 34, 37 of us that will be leaving, going on domestic missions. So lift us up in prayer. Pray for the machine. Pray for the electronics. Pray for the driver. Pray for alertness. Pray for the people. Pray for the children. Pray for the traffic. Pray for a safe, rewarding, successful trip to our missionaries. And it will be a great culture sh uh, trip and as well as a great trip to minister to other people. So lift our missionaries up in prayer. Lift them in prayer. Are there any praise reports or prayer requests? Praise reports or prayer requests. So today, as you have a, a final total as of tonight, I remember part of it. I don't remember the sense. I don't remember the sense, but I will give you the dollar figure. Um, $35,500 has been donated to our mission trip with our goal being $40,000. $35,500? $35,538. $35,000. The number is $35,500 has been given 
our tour and our mission trip. Thank you so much. Let me say thank you to those who are who are, are joining us by broadcast and streaming. Thank you for, for your support. Thank you for uh, pushing children to the next level. And thank you for your, your prayers. Thank you, New Beginning Church, for, for all that you have done during this season. We started preparing for this like nine months ago, and God is making it a reality. It's going to be an adventure that our children will never, ever, ever forget. And it's going to be an adventure that their parents will never, ever, ever forget because there got to be a parent with at least one of those children. Amen? And so it's going to be an adventure for, for everybody, including ourselves. So thank you so much for, for your country contributions. Amen? Amen. Why don't we stand? We want to thank, uh, thank this this. Um, Yes. Thank you so much for, for joining us again tonight. And, and the little baby. Thank y'all for joining us again tonight. God bless you. So, Minister Preston. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy, your grace. God, we thank you for keeping us. We thank you, Father God, for being a great God. Thank you, Lord, for blessing our lives. Now, Lord, we come lifting up our missionaries. Bless us with safe passage. Lord, we ask you to bless Father God in such a way that it will be an amazing trip, an amazing adventure, amazing experience with you, Father God. Bless us as we go, Father God. Keep us far away from any accidents. Keep our drivers alert. Keep the machine rolling well. Bless our food that no one will get sick. And bless Father God that no one will, will have to suffer. Bless us, Father God, that we will return with a great report. Keep us safe. Keep us in your arms. Lord, we pray for the New Beginning Church. We, we pray, Father God, for every church that doors open in Jesus' name. We ask you to bless, Father God. Bless the preachers who will stand in this pulpit. Bless them to be relevant. Bless them to be clear. And bless them, Father God, that they would deliver the word of God just as you would have it done. Lord, we ask you to keep us down as we're dismissing from this place. Bless our choir as they come to sing songs unto you. Walk with us tonight and bless us, Lord. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him, the only wise and only true God. Be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. I bless you and keep you. We are United United Church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. I bless you and keep you. You are dismissed.